Hello and welcome to the Stem Cell Healing Institute podcast. In case you have any questions, please send us an email to info at stemcellhealinginstitute.com. Thank you and enjoy the podcast. Hello and welcome back to the Stem Cell Healing Institute podcast. We are here with Dr. Sara Fierredo. Um, how are you doing, doctor? Very good, Luis. Thank you so much. Happy uh, New Year. Uh, same, mm -hmm. same to you. Uh, how was your holiday? Wonderful, as always. Uh, okay. Visiting Canada and family, It's uh, as well as patients trying to kill a bunch of birds, as I like to say. Uh, lovely, lovely time. Awesome. Um, well, welcome back to Guatemala. Thank you. And um, we do have an interesting topic today um, in this uh, new 2024. And the topic today is going to be stroke. Stem cells, how can the stem cells help patients that had suffered a stroke? Um, in this case, doctor, what exactly happens when a stroke takes place? Yes. Um, Louise, I think it's important for our listeners to understand that basically a stroke is like a heart attack in the brain. Um, it's a lack of blood supply, hence oxygen, to a part of the brain that has been that has uh, uh, received a blockage of blood flow, and that can usually be in the form of a blood clot or um, a hemorrhage of of some sort, where um, a portion of the brain Re, uh, doesn't receive the oxygen that it needs and it literally the cells can die and um, so we get brain damage and that's when we have the resulting effects of a stroke and what are those effects uh, and what can someone expect after a stroke mm -hmm. um, usually a stroke is uh, it happens in one hemisphere versus another so we have the uh, the right and left hemisphere of the brain and when the stroke occurs on the right hemisphere, for instance, the effects uh, occur in the left side of the body. It's contralateral, we say, and vice versa. So if a stroke occurs in the left side of the brain, the effects are seen and manifested in the right side of the body. So um, that contralateral effect is where we see the, uh, the manifestation in the physical uh, body. So what we tend to see, depending on where the stroke has occurred in the brain, um, it can be anything from uh, paralysis of one side of the body. It can be uh, if it occurs in a part of the brain that controls speech or vision or hearing or various different um, uh, uh, modalities uh, or functions of our body, that's where we see the effects. And, um, and so that's, uh, the, if it's higher up, we tend to see uh, paralysis in the upper body as well as lower body. If it's, um, uh, or sorry, that's, we're talking about spinal cord injury. Sometimes the, the, uh, the strokes can occur in the spinal cord as well. And that's what I mean by if it's higher up in the spinal cord, we see more effects from that, um, uh, that level down. If it's lower, we see more of a paralysis versus a quadro, uh, quadriplegic situation. So um, various different um, forms of a stroke. But if it happens in the brain, we see that contralateral effect. Can we say that a stroke can be age-related? Absolutely. Um, it can be age-related, um, you know, just a normal aging process and uh, the lack of proper prevention and lack of proper care, uh, you know, things, uh, lifestyle uh, can definitely result in a stroke. Can a stroke be preventable? Absolutely, yes. So there are causes, direct causes of strokes, um, things like smoking, um, things like uh, diet. Stress, I suppose. Stress, absolutely. Uh, the chemicals in our body from stress that cause um, uh, can cause directly or indirectly clots and so on and so forth. So there are there's diet, there's hormone, there is um, lifestyle factors like drinking and smoking, especially, um, and uh, not drinking enough water, even for instance. And um, uh, again, lifestyle and and diet can be a big, big, big contributing factor. 
Now, um, let's talk about the stem cells. How can they help um, a patient that has suffered a stroke? Yes. So uh, the stem cells, as I've mentioned in my past podcast, what stem cells do in essence is they renew themselves in order to regenerate a damaged tissue. In this case, the damaged tissue would be the brain um, uh, or perhaps even a spinal cord. Uh, but uh, most often the brain when we talk about a, a cerebral uh, ischemic attack, and that's in the brain. So we're talking about neurons, um, very uh, tissues of the gray matter and the white matter that are related to neurons and total body function. Okay. So in this case, we are hoping for regeneration and the goal is for regeneration of the brain, uh, brain tissue and neurons that have been damaged that are directly related to uh, functions in the body that have been compromised with a stroke. And, um, and so that's the goal is to get the stem cells to the brain effectively uh, with great viability, with high numbers in order to stimulate regeneration in the best possible environment. So you can actually regain brain cells after the stroke, doctor? You got it. Uh, if it's done, absolutely. If it's done correctly, if it's done in the um, uh, with the right environment, creating the environment in the body for the best possible he healing, uh, with the right types and active stem cells, um, in the proper modality and deployment of the stem cells, absolutely. And what would be the best avenue for deploying the stem cells into a patient we, that has suffered a stroke? Mm -hmm. um, this is really important to understand that, again, you probably heard me say that we leave no stones unturned. Oh, yes. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we will do it three different ways. We will do... Uh, IV or intravenous infusion of stem cells with mannitol. Uh, the mannitol is really important in order to allow the stem cells to penetrate the blood brain barrier, um, which otherwise they may not necessarily uh, do, as well as an intranasal aspiration, which is akin to a nose spray of stem cells, uh, as well as intrathecal uh, deployment of the stem cells, which is directly into the vertebral column in the cerebrospinal fluid. And, and that's really important because uh, the, the three are very important because it's almost a direct deployment of the stem cells to where we need them to be. So through the blood, through um, the cribriform plate directly into the brain, as well as uh, into the cerebrospinal fluid that, that coats the brain. So, um, uh, and then what we also do is, as I was mentioning, is we create this environment with oxygen, um, remember, stroke has been essentially it's a lack of oxygen to the brain, causing blood, uh, causing brain damage. So we want to ensure we have oxygenated tissues, we have proper nutrients for uh, the brain to to rebuild, which essentially are good fats. Um, the brain is is all fat. Brain matter is all fat. So we have to ensure that we have a. Uh, we supplement and we have a, a diet that is high in fat and the right types of fats, as well as uh, the oxygen, as I mentioned, as well as when I mentioned creating an environment, it's an in internal milieu, uh, nutritionally with oxygen, so on and so forth. But also, um, we, we want to create an environment and we have, uh, we have ways and exercises in which the patient can uh, literally exercise the brain in order to rebuild those neurons. And so this it's part of the rehab that goes along with um, the stem cell treatment, which is really important to, um, to execute uh, in the process as well. So what would the patient feel after receiving the, or, or what would be the improvements that uh, the patient will feel after receiving the, um, the stem cells in time length uh, also? Yes. Um, I always tell my patients the general rule of thumb is three to six months to even sometimes to even start seeing uh, a change. Uh, however, we've had patients start seeing changes in days or weeks, but I always say a good three months because regeneration and building and reconstructing of tissue, it takes time. So it's really important to give that time. So timeline wise, 
we always say uh, three, three to six months to, to start seeing change. What kind of changes can we see? It depends on where the damage has been, uh, has taken place in the brain. So um, like I mentioned, if, it, if the damage occurred or the lack of uh, blood supply and oxygen happened to the Broca's um, uh, area of the brain, which is responsible for speech and affected the speech, we can see uh, patients uh, being able to find words quicker, um, being able to say the words that they were meaning to say quicker. Um, to uh, if it happened in the area of motor function, greater uh, you know uh, motor function where hands and arms have been affected, legs and feet have been affected. We see patients taking steps um, with rehab. We see. Um, uh, vision improve. We've seen uh, auditor auditory improvements. We've had a, a many patients that come that are they you know they lose the ability to sometimes interact with uh, with speech exactly. So speech and where they start interacting, start um, you know joining conversations, laughing more, taking part in conversations. Um, it's quite phenomenal. Um, motor function is a big one because that's where we see patients, you know, ending up in wheelchairs and uh, things like that, or the inability to swallow or to even feed themselves. So uh, the improvement in motor function is has been huge where we see a, a big improvement. Awesome, doctor. Um, and this takes, uh, how many sessions would it take for a stroke patient? Thank you for asking that, Louise, because that's a really important question. Our goal with the number of stem cells and viability of stem cells, uh, the numbers that we deploy and the way that we do it with the whole comprehensive treatment, uh, treatment and I mentioned uh, the hormone therapy, the oxygen, we do also the stem cell enhancement and detoxification and again, creating that environment. Um, our goal is one treatment. However, we don't want to mislead patients in, in telling them that they're gonna be perfect or cured after one treatment. After one treatment, most patients and actually all patients do see an improvement. Um, again, it could be a 20% improvement, an 80% improvement. We can never say, um, but we have seen always an improvement. Uh, however, after a year or so, we always reassess and patients will, will decide um, whether they want to come back for another treatment in order to see a more improvement. Uh, a lot of patients are happy after one treatment. Um, with the, uh, uh, just building on the, the improvements that they have seen. Um, but a lot of patients feel that, hey, you know what? We've seen improvement and we want to try for more. And so it's always a very subjective um, a decision and a subjective choice for patients. And uh, we make that uh, decision and, and uh, assessment as a team. And we do have to explain that they have to come down to Guatemala, right? Absolutely. Thank you, Louise. Yes, we, it is important for patients to understand that this treatment is not available in North America, in the U.S., nor in Canada. Um, the, the way uh, that we deploy uh, the manipulation, the quote unquote, that the F uh, FDA using, uses that terminology in the U.S., where stem cells are grown uh, combined with other growth factors, for instance, None of that is allowed in the U.S. Uh, neither is um, using stem cells from another source other than the patient's own body. These are all important uh, things to remember when considering stem cells um, inside the U.S. Uh, versus outside of the U.S., um, which can, in essence, really uh, affect the results and the outcomes for a patient. I used to practice in Arizona for many years, so I know the limitations of stem cell uh, practice and the stem cell treatment in the U.S. very much. So, um, and this is the reason why we do this in, in Guatemala. So, doctor, after the patient comes to Guatemala, how long do they have to stay mm -hmm. for the treatment? Usually it's seven, seven to ten days, depending on uh, uh, the degree of treatment, what we need to treat, how many areas we need to treat. Uh, so on and so forth. So, you know, it's, it's often, most often than not, it's about seven to seven days. Um, and, it's, and in very rare cases, it can be up to 10 days. 
So we have patients come uh, come down, and then a lot of patients decide to do a lot of uh, a little bit of touring and sightseeing, and that's when they can decide to extend their visit. And within the package, uh, the accommodations are included, right? Absolutely. Okay. We include uh, the accommodations that are necessary uh, in a very very comfortable Airbnb type of an apartment. Uh, usually, it's a two bedroom, so they can bring family without any any issues as well as a personal driver uh, to take them to and from appointments and run errands, get groceries if they want to cook in the apartment. Uh, and, and so it's very, very comfortable. Well, Dr. I don't know if I miss anything. Um, can you? I think we've covered a lot of ground here today for All our right. first podcast of the year, Luis. Yeah. Well, I appreciate your time. And in case you want to contact Dr. Fioredo, by the end of this podcast, you will find all the information how to contact us. Um, you have a great day. Thank you, Louise. You too. Bye-bye. Take care. Thank you for listening. In case you have any questions, please visit our website, stemcellhealinginstitute.com. Or you may send us an email to info at stemcellhealinginstitute.com. If you want to contact us from North America, you may dial plus 1-209-690-7836. If you want to send us a message through WhatsApp, please add us at plus 502-4220-7297. And this is how you find us on our social media. On Facebook, Stem Cell Healing Institute. On Instagram, Stem Cell HI. On Spotify, Stem Cell Healing Institute. On YouTube, Stem Cell Healing Institute. We hope to hear from you. Thank you.